So I'd like to acknowledge the Turum, Turrbal and Jagera people, um, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and any other Indigenous people present today. Um, I come from Melbourne, I live on Wurundjeri land. Um, thank you so much, Maggie, that was just awesome, so many great points, and I just wrote a couple of little notes to just follow on, because I want you to just take Maggie's presentation as an intro, because um, I would have just said, I completely I'm on board with all that stuff. Um, I've got a son called Finn. There's going to be a community consultation that I want to show you um, about connecting with children and really truly listening to them, and you'll see him on that. But um, I just want to, as a father of two children, I've got a five and a half and a three and a half year old. Um, I have one who's just come out of hospital with concussion from the youngest one from falling out of her brother's bed. And I'm living that, um, that life at the moment with two young children, which keeps me very busy. I'm a terrible parent. I'm impatient, I get angry, and I'm learning a lot about myself. My wife is incredibly patient and soft and gentle, and she's taught me a lot. I wanted to talk about some things that I think I've done as a good parent, because we're all a mix, right? My son, Finn, was nagging me. He's a persistent child, and when he gets his mind on something, he will not stop. And he kept talking to me about Lego. So if collectively from all of his parents and friends and birthday parties, he would probably have $1,000 worth of Lego, I would think, in this box. And what he does is he builds it all, follows the things, and, he's, and unfortunately, unlike the old school Lego, once he's finished the booklet, he wants a new Lego with a new booklet and all the new pieces. And I'm like, they're the same pieces. You know, but he wants to, and it's kind of unfortunate that we've, we live in this world now. So I said to him, I'm not going to buy you any more Lego. And with children, it takes patience. So what I said to him was, you can buy the Lego, and I'm not giving you any money. But I love talking about businesses. I've always been interested in businesses and how they work and how you actually make them survive. And people who actually run businesses that are profitable, I run a non-profit, amaze me, because it's hard. And so I said to him, I will help you to run a business to get Lego. I'll do, you know, we'll just talk about it. So it took about two weeks, and we finally worked out what we were going to do. Down at a holiday house, we are going to um, bake some cakes together, and we're going to sell them to the local community. So we woke up early on a Saturday. He always wakes up early because he's full of beans, and we made some lemon slice, and we made some um, honey joys, and we made some um, chocolate brownies. And just a hint, chocolate brownies, profit margins, massive compared to everything else. <laughs> honey joys, useless. No one wants to pay more than 50 cents for a honey joy. No profit in a honey joy. So, and then, and then we were like, okay, so we've got all these cakes, where do we go? We're at the beach, right? Just so happened that there was like four and a half to six foot swell that day. So we went to the car park of the local surf club. And as the surfers were coming off the waves after a five hour dawn sesh, there was my son, big smile with his plate of biscuits, meeting them at their cars where they had the money. So we had to work out, you know, where do these people actually have money? They don't have them in their wetsuits. Um, he made $350 in about a couple of hours. We did a, after that, the, like, the learning from this activity was incredible. This is me being a good dad. We, we, he, he paid me back, so we had, he, I invested in the business and gave him all the materials. He had to pay me back and count all that out. And it was a really incredible learning experience. And I want to say, there's a lot of educators in this room. Please, do real things. I'm sick of you planning ideas, planning things, and not actually doing them. Like going, hey, let's do this cool thing, and we get to all the planning stages, and then we submit the assignment, and we never do it. Like, go out and rally for something, right? So. Another thing we did was me and him, we built, so I built lots of car tire and very simple playground structures. So we started making cubbies and teepees and things in our local park. I am very, very blessed and privileged to live in an area that has a, um, my, I live in an apartment, I have a patio, you open the back gate and I have acres of football fields and parks and we specifically chose to live there because of that. And we started building our little playground. And it was really well accepted. I didn't start it. Someone else put a swing on a tree, a little rope swing, and I put in some little swings and seesaws, and we had a bunch of just little bits and pieces that we found from hard rubbish, and we'd throw them in there. And whenever I'd find a bike, a kid's bike on the side of the road, I'd just throw it out in the park, and it'd last a week. And then a kid who needed a bike would steal it. And I was like, great, we'll just get another one. Um, but that, that process was real. 
And what happened from that was one day the council removed it. it. Took two and a half years. They turned a blind eye to it. They were incredible. But one day, someone said to someone, something said something, 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 and sadly it was removed. And I actually spoke to the playground head of the playgrounds in the council, and they said, "Are you kidding? We we just left that. I didn't want it to be removed, and it, sadly it was removed." That process of taking action in our community ended up in that our crap park, which was the playground on the other side of the oval that no one played on, got a $100,000 refurbishment and they used a lot of playground ideas, ideas and the things that we'd built, the kids had built in the park to redesign that playground. So they got a natural playground. We now have a, um, a really adventurous little, a little BMX track's gonna go in there, lots of planting, lots of rocks and stones and logs. So I just encourage you to do real things with kids because it's really amazing. Um, all right, so let's move on to actually what I'm here to talk about. So this is beautiful. Alung, five years old, Guatemala. This is a community consultation with one of our, what I call our Global Play Alliance people, which I'll talk about later. Um, Alung drew a dinosaur that had a ladder going up the legs, a slide going down the dinosaur's back, and two little swings hanging off the, the little stumpy arms, which I loved. This is what we built. And this is in the middle of nowhere. This is a very remote community in, um, in Guatemala. And what I, the reason I want to show you this is because children have this rich inner life of imagination. And we can talk to them, and we've heard from them today. But my, my challenge to you is you've almost got to flip a switch in your brain and say, I'm not just listening to this child. I'm actually going to believe them, and I am actually going to do what they said, because it's awesome. Like, I've, I've built and designed heaps of playgrounds. I'm now at the point where I don't even care anymore. So if they say, I want a dinosaur with the swings and whatever, I'm like, awesome, great start. Like, this, was a, this site was a flat, desolate school with a fence. There was nothing of inspiration there. And so we're like, Alan, cool guy, he can be our designer. So we did it, you know? And, I, and I, consultation is, is, is so important to actually really listen. Oh yeah, this is, this is a listening to kids for an um, environmental park where we're building a playground. Move the volume up a little bit. I'm here at Ceres today because you might have heard that Ceres has won a Pick Your Project grant to improve this incredible space and we'd love to get your feedback too. So my daughter's in the black and white stripy dress and my son's in a black and white wind cheater on the, this side here. Oh, found you found something. something? Oh my god, they're huge. There's so many underneath. Just there? take a round. There's big ones, there's little ones. Don't I take a round? Oh, oh, what is it? It's a beetle. It looks like a turtle. So that's why it's got lots of dirt. Yeah, lots of dirt because they like to dig. Oh, oh, I found it. <laughs> what are we gonna do? Make a tunnel with a caterpillar brain going through it. Like yeah. giant micro. Yeah, like massive ones that are real. Know, and they're big, just like, big. It's like a dirt. big millipede slide. And you can go all the way from up there and you can come all the way down. But like a climbing wall that looks a lot like dirt. And then you can put like a kingfisher like eating an earthworm. Maybe you could put There's like an earthworm going through the top of that. You could do something with like these random holes. A big spider web. Yeah, a big spider web. You could like swing on the vines. Or you could pretend that they were like butterflies like and then you can have it like up in the air, but like it's like on posts, and then you can have like big vines hanging off the butterfly. We can have a swing, but it's like a bee that you can ride on. Like maybe not an actual bee. Maybe we could make a robotic bee that could walk around here. And you could ride on it. Yeah. So you know that steep hill that's coming down from the tree house? I think maybe we should put a slide that is coming down except Ooh, like shaped like, like a bug. Could we made like Copies 
series is a special place and we need your feedback. Please fill in the survey, let us know what you think. We love, love, love to hear your thoughts. Can you imagine if we built every playground with ideas like that? So this playground is going to have an earthworm. So from this community consultation and the 180 other, 85 other bits of feedback we got, we got such amazing feedback. These parents, I mean, I live in a, a liberal, well-educated suburb. We got, but the level of education and, 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 and desire for a high quality um, playground and, and their, their education on how important play was and the types of play was amazing. We got, like we had, qualitative research where people were talking about open-ended play and loose parts and, and sticks and stones, no plastic, non-toxic, indigenous stuff. It was really, the feedback was incredible. The level, I think we un, uh, underestimate sometimes the level of knowledge there is in the community about what people want. So this slide, one of the, we've got these amazing guys, series is an amazing place with lots of things, but uh, it used to be a bluestone quarry that then transitioned to landfill that was then capped and then became this incredible environmental space. And one of the pieces that's probably going to come out of this is a giant bug that you can crawl on and in. And just to get this idea of the scale, the legs are likely to be made out of six, so you imagine six legs, and each leg will be um, the arm of an excavator. Like, it's going to be truly amazing. So just, I mean, I was, it was so inspiring to hear those kids and, and we're really going to listen to them and we're really going to create that place of wonder and magic for them. This is another, another space in the Bahamas that we recently did. Um, through community consultation, all local materials, very different space, much more of a sort of a normal playground, I guess. That's a slide with no sheet metal, so it never rusts. All car tire treads you can cut with a Stanley knife. This is kind of like a, a home cubby area and there was loose parts were gonna go into this section. Um, and this is all based on community feedback, planting all down the side that's gonna grow up and over this. This is a market space with uh, a juice shop and a fruit shop and a boat shop. And on the other side, I love this stuff. We put it in, we, we've got a clinic. And as a death spe specialist, Maggie, that's really important, a hairdresser. And we've got an auto shop with those loose tires and a blue flame special motorbike on the side here. Uh, another motorbike, some flat spaces which are already there, which we're gonna paint on. This thing you can see in front here is a giant seesaw all connected. So um, when you step on one, the whole thing moves and it wobbles and moves. And it, I thought you'd like that one, Maggie, as well. And then, and then a quiet, you know, lots of plantings and then a quiet kind of um, seated space here. So, and that was all done in a place in the school which was completely, completely, not even considered a possibility for as being space. It was this, like, can you imagine, here's the front of the school, it was the little strip on the side. It was 60 metres long and about four and a half metres wide. A place that most educators would, or principals wouldn't even think could be a space, and that can now be played in by um, you know, hundreds of children. And actually, it's now become the main playground. They have a quadrangle that they don't play in. These, those tire loops, as I said, you cut them with a Stanley knife in about five minutes. You cut every second tire tread with a grinder until they're nice and smooth, and then you just bolt them back together. And this slide is made out of two bits of metal. It costs almost nothing. Okay, the cost of this playground, I think, in total was about 10,000 US dollars. And we'll probably be cheaper here, because the Bahamas, gets almost all their materials from the US and you're paying US dollars plus shipping and tax. So pretty high play value. Um, yeah, so the, in terms of what we do, Playground Ideas has an offer for you, all of you educators out there. Playground Ideas has, does three main things. You can come to our website, you can log in, you get a dashboard, and you can do all of the following things tomorrow. You can get 150 downloadable, step-by-step, -step, IKEA-style designs where you can go and collect a bunch of stuff locally and build your own playground. Along with that, we have, we, we took, you know, we've been talking about all these evil apps and games, so we, we um, did a bit of a Robin Hood on that, and we took one of the, the platform for those evil games, the game thing, and we hacked it until we could put a playground 
3D playground designer on it. So kids can drag and drop on laptops um, a playground design together. So you can collaboratively, they can each design their own playground in a computer lab and put it together and then they can print them out and then they can, kids can vote on them and they can comment on them and whatever. And you can do a whole collaborative process with children to do that stuff. We've got um, seven manuals ranging from a five-step playground um, manual. We've got a cartoon version of the playground safety standards, so you can get you know, make kids make sure kids don't do all the deadly stuff like strangulation and entrapment and stuff. It's all explained in cartoons. A kid could even read it. Um, we've got a loose parts play manual, and I'll talk a bit more about loose parts later. And uh, we're just about to release an early childhood and care manual and a bunch of other stuff. It's all available in your, in your um, dashboard and you can download each one of them for free. Um, the other thing we do is we can come out and we can help you create a playground like what you've seen and do those consultations and help you to kind of do all that stuff. And we have a, what's called, it says global unity, which is not right. It, it's the, a global play alliance. So these are people who are building, who've come to us, who've built one playground and then they've made a commitment to build more. And we now support a, what we call our global play alliance, which is a, just a, a collaborative group across the world who are building playgrounds using our stuff and then feeding into our network their learnings so that we can add to this community. It's a really amazing thing. And we're now, like, we're, we've now gotten funding from um, the Rockefeller Foundation and then we, and we're now working with those local partners to deliver projects all over the world, which is something I never thought would happen, but it's really exciting. And we also run a social enterprise and I'll talk a bit more about that later. We are spending billions of dollars, and I mean billions of dollars, trying to help children thrive in the world. And these statistics terrify me. So you think we've got problems in Australia. We know that 250 million children, just think about that in terms of a football stadium, these thousands of stadiums full of children, are failing to reach their full and this is a technical term, full developmental potential. That is the density, the connectedness of their brains and their bodies. And that equates to 43% of children in sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia. Just want you to just marinate in the, the gravity of that. Two thirds, 60 to 66% of children in sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia, this is really important, are failing their basic local curriculum after four years at school. And that is the local curriculum. That's not an international baccalaureate. That's not an Australian curriculum. That is their local curriculum, which is often years behind. And that creates a snowball effect, which equates to billions of lost uh, GDP. So they predicted it equates to a lost 30% loss of adult productivity, 30%. His statistics are shocking. I would be quite happy for that two-thirds statistic to be, let's throw away two-thirds of what we're doing in school because it is completely failing. And we are not equipping our children's brains and bodies and spirits to be able to cope with the challenges in this modern day life. And you guys know this stuff. This is from Unilever, the Dirt is Good campaign, which I thought was incredible. If you haven't seen the ad that goes with this thing, um, that uh, Aussie kids spend less time outdoors than a maximum security prisoner. And there's a fantastic um, ad that goes along with this from those guys. Uh, I went to Unilever a couple of years ago and spoke to them about this stuff, and they've been instrumental in the outdoor um, classroom day and a bunch of other stuff. Um, but there's some good news. So a lot of these statistics come from uh, disadvantaged communities in the States, longitudinal studies in the States, um, and also one of them's from Jamaica. But what we found is that if you stimulate young children early, the 40, this first statistic comes from one additional hour of stimulating play with a untrained paraprofessional over two years. So between zero and three, um, a person came in, played some games and did some face-to-face -face kind of stuff with kids and did no other intervention for 20 years. Those children, 20 years later, without any intervention in school, had a 42% increase in their annual earnings. 
That is the equivalent over a lifetime if those opportunities of extra money don't kind of snowball, which obviously they would, of having Hayano and me working and I, for 18 years of my life, I took all of my salary and gave it to him because he got to play more. This is not minuscule stuff. This is massive. This is, this is poverty changing. This is world changing stuff. 44% increases in high school graduations in disadvantaged communities. I think it was in Harlem for that study. And a 17% increase in bachelor degrees from stimulating play-based early childhood. And a lot of you guys probably know that stuff, but it's just good to just highlight that there. So um, before, I'm just going to read this because I don't want to waffle on. Before playgrounds, children played, of course, but they played with stuff like nature, right? They didn't play with stuff like this, and I don't need to kind of, to kind of tell you that stuff. Um, but it was ever-changing, and it offered them different challenges every day, which playgrounds like this do not. They're so didactic, up ladder, over platform, down slide, up and down on seesaw. They just, you know, they tell you what to do. Um, Similar to the issues with schools, playgrounds have been refined down to their minimum usable product, something that, they, that a white male industrialist can sell you and make a good profit from. Um, they're not, they're not, playgrounds are full of, I, I, I want to be gentle with this because they're amazing industrialist males, but playgrounds are full of what I call, I've termed Saturday play. It's the stuff that dads see when they take their child to a playground at, from about 50 metres away. And I'm stereotyping here, and I, please, dads, but it's not what, it's not what mums see or stay-at-home dads see in those quiet moments on a Tuesday morning after they've had some milk and they're sitting in the corner with some pillows. It's, it, it, do you know what I mean? This, this has become this kind of this bizarre type of one type of play, and we've missed out on all the rest. And we, we really want to bring back, in terms of playground design, try and bring back that, those little things and all the other details. So I'm jumping around a bit here, but it, can I just have a raise of hands? Does, anybody, does anyone know who Roger Hart is, and have you heard about Hart's Ladder of Participation? Yeah? Oh, OK, not many. Good. OK, I'll go through this. So. Um, we want children to actively participate in the stuff that we do. But not all things that have children in them are actual participation. And I'd strongly suggest you can look this up. There's a million websites that talk about this. And I'm glad there's not that many people because I wasn't sure if I was going to bore you to death. Number one at the bottom, manipulation. OK, and manipulation, decoration, and tokenism have some things in common, but they are non-participation, but they have the window dressing of children attached to them. You know, there was genuine care in listening to these children. They were there for a reason, and they came to tell us something important, to open our eyes about their worlds. All of these first three do not do that. So manipulation is pr things like preschool children carrying political placards when they know no, they have no idea, or a baby with a placard around its neck, you know, advocating for climate change when that child has has no idea what that thing is. Now, I'm not suggesting you shouldn't take your baby to rallies, but the idea of the, the child in that, does that make sense? The child in that process is not an active, committed member to a cause. They're there as a something for, as sort of camera candy um, to, get the, to get the message across. It's token. Um, decoration is similar to the above. Children are used to bolster the cause for sympathy's sake, but with little to no engagement. And tokenism, Children are apparently given voice, but in fact they have little or no choice about the subject or the style of communicating it, and little or no opportunity to formulate their own opinions. Um, children are sometimes used in conference panels. <laughs> that's, that's, sorry, that's the, I didn't know you were going to have kids here, but, but sometimes used in really naff ways that actually they're asked questions, there is an answer that they give, and no one gives a shit what they say. It's just cute to have someone there. Do you, are you sort of with me on that? Okay, number four is youth informed. So children understand the intentions of the project. They know who made the decisions concerning their involvement and why they made those decisions. So it makes sense to them, for them to be involved. Um, they have a meaning, meaningful rather than decorative role. And they volunteer for the project after the project was made clear about what it was. 
So it's not just what they say, but actually they're them being there is a choice. It's a clear choice and something they've been empowered to do. Number five is youth consulted. The project is designed and run by adults, but children understand the process and their opinions are treated seriously. So for instance, there's a commercial example at Nickelodeon, which is a kids TV channel. Um, new ideas for television programs are designed in consultation with children and their voices are taken very seriously and millions of dollars are spent on those ideas. Youth adult equity is the idea that children have the ideas, they, they set up the project and they invite adults to join in making decisions. Um, sorry, sorry, seven is a complete, completely youth driven um, activity where there aren't adults involved and eight is youth adult equity where children have the ideas, set up the project and the adults are joined in to help them make that. And a, a really simple thing, as a, coming back to as a father, um, so my son, just before I left, took a toilet roll into his room. This took him a long time. He climbed up to his bunk and he leaned right out and he tied a, an end of toilet paper to the, the fan, the fin of the ceiling fan, which then dropped down, and then he and then he took a toilet roll and he tied, I'm an outdoor ed teacher, so I've taught him how to vaguely do some simple knots. He tied the other end to the, to the toilet roll and then he was ready to start boxing the toilet roll. Um, and he was super excited about it. And this is what it looked like. I just, it just, just fell apart in a million pieces. And he, <laughs> and he cracked it and he screamed and shouted and kicked his fists on the ground and got all upset. And then, I came back 20 minutes later and his second prototype was essentially the same thing with three layers of toilet paper. Same thing, punch, fall over, massive tantrum. I can't do it, Dad, it's not working. And I, and I just said to him, this is me being a good dad, not a bad dad. I was patient, I had resilience. And I said to him, look, uh, this is prototyping. I'm a designer, I build playgrounds, I design playgrounds, it doesn't always work let's work through this, let's do some design thinking. So why isn't it working? Oh, because it's not strong enough and I can't, because there's nothing strong in this house and whatever. And I was like, okay, well, we'll go to the, so I went out, to, I've got a filing cabinet, I live in an apartment, so I don't have a, a shed, I have a filing cabinet full of bits and pieces. And we found some bungee cord in the shed and we found an old ball, dog ball that had, had sort of dog things, holes chewed in it. And so we got a pair of scissors and cut a little hole. And then we, what we ended up making was a, a bungee cord tied to the fan coming down in a little ball, and he was stoked. But that is an example of a project where the child initiates, and I am purely there as a support, you know? And I opened up the thing, we, you know, do you want rope or do you want bungee cord? You know, these are all the things we've got, what would work? You know, which kind of ball, you want a big ball, a small ball? You know, these are, you know, what, what are the balls that we got? Oh, I remember there was something in the shed. You know, and it, it's totally different. And it's really great to be part of those projects, but they are very hard in a school environment. So I imagine there are some educators here thinking, oh man, that's really, that's really hard. But again, I come from a pretty hardcore view. I would literally do all of everything that you do in school curriculum in the first third of the day and clear off the rest of the, the two thirds of the day to do real projects and assess all the other stuff, the maths and language, through those real projects. That's how I would run a school if I was gonna, if I could change the world. Um, this is a seesaw. I hate seesaws, really, like this. They're quite dangerous, kids knock their teeth out, you know, um, <laughs> they, they, there's, there's a million YouTube videos that I could have chosen for that, for that piece. They don't have foot pegs. They're just, that's just not very well designed, I don't think. And, and children, when you talk about risk and hazard in playground design, a risk is something you can see, that you can assess, and you can choose to engage in. That is what I would call a hazard. There's no foot pegs there. It's poorly designed. It flips up way, the, the middle fulcrum bit is too high, so it goes on too much of an angle, and the child is holding down here, and they pivot forward, and they smash their face on a metal bar. That's what I'd just call a crap hazard. So you can fix that by lowering the middle pivot, you can put foot pegs, you can do a whole bunch of things to make, you can still have that rough, bumpy kind of thing, but a kid doesn't lose their teeth. So this is, but, but the only other thing I think is important in playground design, when you actually watch and observe kids and hear what they have to say, which I've been doing over the last 10 years, is 
we've taken these ideas, so you'll see the next thing is, is the this, is this same idea as a seesaw, but we've taken it and we've added multiple other layers of engagement for children in a seesaw. So what you're going to see next is social play, game creation, rule creation through game creation. You're going to see um, kids uh, sitting, standing, and moving in all sorts of different ways through what we call our balanced seesaw hybrid. See, I love the way the kid lifts off in the corner there. You know, this little kid, who does, it's too rough for this little kid, but he just wants to be in it, right? So, and you'll notice there's a pinch hazard on that seesaw. This was almost finished, but we put a, a strip of, a strip of tire tread either side of the wooden plank to remove, to remove that little, this was late at night during the construction process, to remove that issue of kids putting their finger in there, because obviously they could hurt themselves. Um, this seesaw doesn't have the big bump because we like multi-age play because the little kids who can't handle the big bump and a lot of these schools that we work in have huge age ranges where you've got teenagers and really very small kids will go flying. So the loops of tyre tread underneath each end soften that movement and create a, it's kind of, it's sort of funny, I can see you're all kind of mesmerised by this kind of, hey. um, uh the, the, the bumper bars underneath sort of give it this, this kind of r rough and solid movement, but um, it allows lots of different children to be able to engage in it. Do you guys, is that cool? Would you love that in your own school? And its structure, the fact that it's a square with the tires in between, says to a child, let's create rules. Let's create a game. And that's what we see. When you create symmetry and pattern, so one thing I don't always love about nature playgrounds is everything's rough and in kind of, you know. Kids love white painted lines on a bitumen surface in symmetry because they create games out of it. It's this, it, it prompts you to say, I want to create something that we can kind of, we, you know, we create rules around it and then we create this whole narrative that we can do. So, um, yeah, so that's, uh, this was part of our 50 Playgrounds in India project. Okay, um, a simple community consultation. I think this is really important. This is the meat of what I want to talk about today. Um, I want you to just grab a pen, and we're literally going to do this super, super fast. So you grab your little pen and paper, and I want you to very quickly draw your life, not to scale, just draw your life on a scale. So I want you to draw your house, maybe like where you work, your local park, the things that are important to you that you go and visit regularly that sort of bound your general life. If you've got a holiday house you go to every weekend, just draw it on the end of the road on the side of the page, if you know what I mean. So scale is not important at all. So this is something I do with kids all the time. I get them to just very roughly sketch out their life. Um, and I, I wanted to, I've got a bunch of pictures, but I didn't get a chance to put one in. But And then, so I just want you, you know, put in little symbols, like just a little home symbol, maybe a building for your work or whatever it is. Um, playgrounds might have a little symbol of a set of swings or something, a river. You know, things that were important to you. And for kids, I would be talk we're talking about their lives, mostly with adults and teachers. Um, I would say um, that draw where you grew up as a child, right? Because it's, or you really want to get them into that space. And sorry, I made a bit of a mistake, so I should have said to you guys that it was kid stuff, because the next step I tell kids is, now I want you to draw little symbols on that map of where you play. So things like you might want to draw a little um, tree trunk that you play underneath, or a little creek, or like Hayano's beautiful movie last night, you know, that little... So I'm basically the Melbourne version of Hayano in terms of the dad. I'm always running down to those ditches and stuff and walking through gross water with kids and stuff like that. So those kinds of things. Oh, there's that little bit of water that we go down to. You know, um, me and Finn have got, my son have got these little, this willow tree that sort of has this amazing natural cubby. So I want you to just draw a bunch of those things. And you can imagine how kids would, kids just get into this stuff. All right, that's, that's in for the practical stuff. Now, what I would do from this point, once you've got that map, 
is we would tear that off and put it somewhere else. You don't need to do that. I'll, I'll just tell you, take you through the next set. Then if, it was, if you had um, post-it notes, I would use post-it notes, or you can just get scrap paper and just tear it, you know, tear up an A4 sheet into 12 bits of paper. And I would say, I want you to write down on an individual piece of paper what those play activities, each one of those play activities is. And some, some kids will come up with 50 things on a page. You know, I imagine, like, Hayana, your kids would just have this endless list of all these cool things that they do. And you give them a few minutes and they'll be writing things like the local, you know, swinging at the swings and, um, you know, uh, playing in the rocks and, you know, playing under... And it can be home things, out, indoor, outdoor things, you know, playing with little figurines under my bed. It doesn't matter what those things are. This will take a little while and you can, you can do this as a quite a quick thing or a, a much more in-depth thing or a much quicker thing. And then what you want to do is you get all the kids into groups. Like, just the, like this environment is actually perfect for this. You get, you know, eight or ten kids around a table with all their little bits of paper. And you, you, you say, um, there's no leader. I just want you to start putting the, paper down, putting the papers down and telling your friends what they are. And I want you to chat about it and have this really fervent discussion and, and, and organise them into groups. And I should actually, I want to credit... Uh, Hitoshi Shimomura from Tokyo Play. I don't know if anyone knows him. Absolutely incredible guy. That this is really very much based on um, a workshop that I did with him years ago that blew me away. Um, so all these bits of paper, and you categorise them. So the kids can categorise them in any way that they choose. They might say these are natural play, these are running games, these are um, you know water things, these are cooking things, these are home things. It does, the categories don't matter. And then um, once you've kind of got a clear idea of them, then if you've got the time, it's great to do a little walk around from from table to table with the whole group, so they get to see the categories. And then if you can afford the poster notes, just because they work on a wall, what I would do is I would take all of those categories and then get the entire group to do that whole categorization thing again on a massive wall. So this wall would be perfect. So it's all spread out on this wall, all these different um, groups of things all stuck together. And, and it creates a really fervent discussion. And people can, you know, some kids are sneaking extra things that they didn't think about on the walls and stuff like that. But there's one important thing that I haven't asked the kids once. And it's the first thing that if I told you to consult with com a community about a playground, what's the first, I hate these questions that are leading questions, but this one's pretty obvious for me. What's the first question you would want to ask kids about a playground if you were designing a playground? What do you want in your playground? I didn't ask it once. It's the crappest question to ask children. Because they'll either say two things, swing, slide, seesaw. And you're like, OK, just wasted all my afternoon. I knew that already. Or what they do is they get the popular kid. So Hayano draws, draws something really cool. And everyone goes, oh, <laughs> Hayano is so cool. <laughs> I'm going to copy his drawing. And you get 27 of the same drawings. Like, literally, I've had, I've had classes where they're the same, and the worst case scenario was something I did in Uganda, was the teacher did a drawing, and the kids all copied the drawing, and then gave it to me, and homework done. A really, really difficult to design a playground with, a, with an unactive community like that. So, by doing this, you're actually really teasing out the realities of what's going on out there, and you're really understanding the community at the same time, and you're getting all this fantastic, organised data that you can use to do a real design from a real idea. Does, is, am I hitting home with this? Is this making kind of a nod if you kind of think that that would be cool? Um, it's really powerful. Um, and then you can take photos of it, you can collate it, you can you know, put it into a spreadsheet if you want, and you can see what the priorities are. And then once you get to this point, then you can start to make decisions. So as the designer, because I don't think like, you know, I don't think adults are are stupid. They've got lots of great ideas and, and landscape architects or people who've got experience in design can add a lot to this process. What you can start to do is you can say, well, actually, you know, 50 kids have said they love playing in a swimming pool, but we've got a swimming pool in the school. We're not going to build another one. But it's clearly a high priority. So how could we create, I don't know, extra free play sessions in the swimming pool at the school? Or I don't know. Like, there are certain things you'll see there, which is really great data that shows the priorities of the kids. And you can kind of go, how do we emphasize this with the existing resources we have? 
But then there'll be this whole beautiful, big, diverse category of things that you never even thought of. And those things are awesome. Really rich, deep information that you can use. And you can do that with multiple communities. You can do this on a massive community scale. You can do it with the grade ones, with a tiny little bit of bitumen out the back of their classroom that no one uses. So big, small, it's totally scalable. So um, I wanted to finish off with um, something that probably some people in this room are going to be like, whoa, I really hate that idea. So I want to preface, I'm serious, like there are some nature play people and some loose parts play people who use recycled and junky parts who might look at this and go, this is a commercialization of an idea that should be free, anyone can do this. Well, I'm here to say I've been doing this for a long time and I've seen Play for Life in Melbourne and a whole bunch of incredible loose parts play things not last. And it makes me really sad. And I always wonder, like, what is it? And it, because it's hard. It's hard to maintain when kids are smashing loose parts. It's hard to, you know, to clean up the thing so you can mow. Like, it's not just that you want to clean it up for tidy's sake. You've got to mow the lawn sometimes. And there are practical things in schools for loose parts. So um, this is a deliberately, completely generic way to instantly create high quality, stimulating play in any environment. And when I say any environment, I mean hardcore South Sudanese refugee camp or little, little bitumen strip out the back of your classroom. It's instant, and my hope is that if, you, if there's anyone here who's studied permaculture or anything, um, one thing they talk about is pioneer plants. So you know how when you've got a sand dune that comes down to the ocean, basically from the water's edge, too harsh, too harsh, too harsh. There's nothing can grow in there. And as you start to come up the dunes, you get these really hardy plants, often little tuber plants that have the energy in the soil way back behind the dunes, and they are, they are able to use that energy over there, because there's nothing here, to enter into this really barren landscape. I see this as the pioneer plant of loose parts. This is where it starts. And in this cart is enough space for you to add your own loose parts and to grow that over time as your parent group and as the people in your school get more active and get more comfortable with it, it evolves over time. It, you add in sticks, you add in um, maybe some mud, you add in some water and all these other things over time as people become comfortable with it. So without further ado and with a lot of apologetics about there, just in case anyone was... Um, this is Noodle Cart, which we've, we've deliberately not used the word play because sometimes um, we want to just sort of focus on actually what this stuff is, which is that it's deep, loose parts play for me is deep flow state learning. It's that beautiful state you get into when time disappears. Um, and I love this image um, of Kids make these sort of incredible pieces of artwork and it's almost reflective of their brain kind of connections. You know, it almost looks like this sort of neuronal connections in their brain that as they, as they do these things, as they dig giant bear holes or whatever it is for whatever reason, they're, they're putting together things that we don't understand in their brains and it doesn't matter to us. You just got to let it go and say, well, okay, so it's going to be bear traps today. Um, so... Noodle cart doesn't say anything to the child deliberately, and by saying nothing, and in saying nothing, it allows the child to say anything. So Noodle cart is a series of boxes which can be configured in a million different ways, um, and it's actually self-manageable by the children. So the children can roll this thing out of the classroom or wherever it's stored, play with it, put it back together, and bring it back in. So there's no nuts and bolts. All of the, these little pegs that you see at the top here with the holes in them, which are play parts in themselves, um, uh, is how the whole thing locks back together. So it's like a kind of a giant Meccano set. Um, this is what it looks like. And this is it being trialled in a Lebanese informal, which just means more hardcore than the UNICEF uh, refugee camps doesn't have the same services, early, informal early childhood centre in Lebanon for, um, for three to five-year-olds, but actually we, had, we ended up having kids up to 14 
in there. The children who are in this refugee camp have come from places like Aleppo. They, are, they have lived for years in a traumatic state, fight or flight, short-term thinking, not thinking about the future. They are desperately in need of coming out of that state into a world where they're calm and they can go back into their own, into their normal path of neuronal, cognitive, social, emotional, and all that stuff, development. And the longer that they live in seeing their parents in a panic, seeing their community in a panic, and all that stress, the longer they're in that space, the more time they are not developing their brains, and the more behind they're getting. And what we now know very clearly is that, we, that if they don't get that time, it actually, it's like a snowball at the top of the hill, kids who get a lot of stimulation, the snowball's just bigger at the start and much bigger at the end. And these kids who miss out, they have a tiny little snowball at the start and it has a massive roll-on effect throughout their lives. This is it being used. And what I want you to notice particularly is not the box, which is kind of, this is prototype two. We have a much more refined version with rounded edges and it looks much nicer. But look at the affect on these kids' faces. They're just like any other kid. They're not thinking right now about the building that is just in shatters in Syria. They're just in that flow state, which is where they should be. Um, so this is just a little one minute We are now clip. in Beirut, we are in the Fab Lab, and we are oh, constructing um, loose part play cards for our next project. Um, and we're starting from nothing, and now we are having two cards by tonight. So we've been visiting uh, refugee camps within Beirut and putting our play carts out there for the first time and seeing incredible engagement and fantastic responses from the, the kids. They're absolutely loving it. We've been at JCC this week implementing cart number two in a very different environment from last week. Lots of smiles, lots of happy people, lots of engaged teachers and you know people from the organisation itself really seeing the benefits of what this can do for people anywhere. That's, so that's Noodle Cart and um, I mean I really just want to finish up by saying so number one, uh, later in this year we want to do a Noodle Cart world tour. And I would love to work to deliver a noodle cart to a re remote or indigenous community group and to document that process of what that looks like and to, you know, to keep refining the idea. And we'll be also going to South Sudan and a bunch of other really crazy places to, to see how it works. Um, and um, sorry to all the Brisbane people here, but we, we are also running a, um, a trial before the middle of this year where we're going to have a, a cart that we want to take to a Victorian school. So if you are a Victorian school and you would like to try this out in your school and see how it works, um, I'd love to talk to you. So thank you so much, and I think it's basically time, right? Thank you so much. <laughs>